Our next presentation is titled MRI, Volumetric Extent of Contrast Enhancement and Resection in Oligodendroglioma Tumors. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tejas Sankar, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the AANS for giving me the opportunity to, uh, on behalf of my co-authors, to present uh, some of our data here today. I'll be speaking about um, MRI volumetric extent of contrast enhancement and resection in oligodendroglial tumors. Um, and as by way of background, uh, the central concept underlying this study is that the presence of contrast enhancement in oligodendroglial tumors has long been considered uh, to be a poorer prognostic factor. And certainly, contrast enhancement has been used in existing grading scales, such as the St. Anne Mayo uh, pathological grading scale. But of course, there's an inexact correlation between enhancement and the current WHO grading system. Some high-grade tumors, as you all know, do not enhance, and some low-grade tumors do. Um, in addition, there's an uncertain relationship between residual contrast uh, that is left behind after surgery and prognosis. And in addition, un there's an uncertain relationship between contrast enhancement and genetic markers of prognosis in these tumors, specifically uh, the 1P19Q loss of heterozygosity. And so the objectives of this study were, were threefold. First, we wanted to determine the independent prognostic significance in oligodendroglial tumors of MRI contrast enhancement at diagnosis. Secondly, in those tumors that did enhance, we wanted to determine the prognostic significance of the initial volume of contrast enhancing tissue. And secondly, the presence and volume of residual enhancing tissue following surgical resection done quantitatively. And finally, we wanted to determine if there was a relationship between contrast enhancement and common genetic alterations in oligodendroglial tumors, specifically 1P19Q deletion. And so we performed a retrospective analysis of patients taken from our institutional oligodendroglioma database prior to January of 2001. We included those patients who had a preoperative axial T1-weighted MRI with gadolinium, and they also had to have had an early postoperative enhanced MRI scan uh, so that any residual enhancement was indeed residual tumor and not postoperative change. And, of course, those MRI scans had to be available in digital format for analysis. We began with 213 eligible patients in the database, and unfortunately we had to eliminate more than half of these because of an incomplete imaging set. Nevertheless, we were left with a uh, substantial sample size of 100 patients who met the required imaging uh, criteria. Of these, 63 uh, had preoperative enhancement and 37 had no preoperative enhancement. How was the volumetry done? Well, MRIs for each patient were de-identified and stored on a workstation. These MRIs were then opened for analysis using the MyPav uh, freeware software package from the NIH. Simply, the MRIs were transformed into a common image space in order to correct for variations in head size and in position. And there was an assessment of the presence of our absence of contrast enhancement and segmentation of enhancing tumor tissue by a single trained observer who was one of the authors of the study. That observer was blinded to patient identity and tumor grade. Enhancing tumor tissue was then resegmented in a subset of those patients by the same observer three months later to ensure intra-rater reliability. Uh, assessments of inter-rater reliability are still ongoing. Enhancing tumor tissue was segmented using a semi-automated uh, protocol, which I'll briefly entail here before depicting pictorially on the next few slides. Simply, a seed voxel containing obviously enhancing tumor tissue is selected on a T1 axial slice, and then the so-called paint-grow algorithm is applied to paint all adjacent voxels containing enhancing tissue within a certain intensity threshold. Manual correction was performed in three planes to make sure that all areas of enhancement were included, and we did exclude areas of cyst or necrosis. Finally, that, those painted areas on each slice were converted to a volume of interest, and the volume of interest uh, volume was indeed calculated by the software. Here's the placement of the seed voxel within a frank area of enhancement. Subsequently, using the paint grow algorithm to uh, incorporate all adjacent enhancing voxels the conversion of that uh, painted area to a volume of interest, the manual correction of that volume of interest in three planes by an expert observer, 
and finally the computation of the actual uh, enhancing tumor tissue volume. We had follow-up available through 2007, so a six-year follow-up for these patients, and our primary outcome measures were time to relapse, defined as you see there, and overall survival. Of course, patients that hadn't died were right censored in our analysis. The entire patient cohort was used to assess the impact of contrast enhancement uh, at diagnosis on outcome. And then, of course, with those patients who had contrast enhancement, 63%, we used them to assess the impact of pre- and post-operative enhancing volumes of tumor tissue on outcome. And we assessed enhancing tumor tissue volume in two ways. First, as a continuous variable, uh, and secondly, as a nominal variable where we section patients into three groups, those that had 100% resection of enhancing tissue, those that had 95 to 99% resection, and those that had 90 to 99% resection. And univariate and multivariate analyses were, were performed in the usual fashion. Uh, and I'll draw your attention here on these patient characteristics over the entire patient cohort. Uh, the mean age was about 43 years, and we had 55 males. And the median time to relapse was 113 weeks for the entire uh, cohort. Median survival was 257 weeks, and as I've mentioned before, 63 of 100 patients had contrast-enhancing tumors at diagnosis. Now, if you look at only the enhancing patients, the mean age was, was comparable, 43 uh, years. And uh, I'll draw your attention to uh, a figure here, which is that the mean percentage of resection of enhancing tumor tissue in these patients was 86%. And of the entire group, only 16 out of 63 actually had a 100% resection of uh, enhancing tumor tissue. And so uh, this left a significant proportion of our patients without a complete enhancement uh, resection. Of course, we, we did also assess the patients for important clinical factors, in particular the presence of an astrocytic component, WHO grading, histological markers of, of aggression, and the presence uh, or delivery of early and late radiation and chemotherapy. And uh, as a third part of the study, we did indeed look at genetic factors with a specific focus on loss of heterozygosity of 1P and 19Q. Our intra-rater reliability was solid. Uh, our intra-class correlation coefficient of 0.85 is, is in keeping for the standard of studies of this, this nature. And so let's take a look at the survival curves here. And first, if we look at the significance of the presence of preoperative contrast enhancement, in our study, indeed, that did produce uh, a significant benefit in terms of time to relapse, and that was significant. That benefit did not hold true, though there was a strong statistical trend towards it for overall survival. Interestingly, um, if we look at the group of patients among those that had enhancing tumor tissue in which 100% of contrast uh, enhancing tissue was, was resected, there was a significant improvement in time to relapse, 174 weeks versus 64 weeks in those with a suboptimal resection. That, didn't, that, that also held true for overall survival. That did not hold true in the groups where there was a greater than 90% but not 100% resection of tumor. And very interestingly, that did not hold true for the group with greater than 95%, but less than 100% resection of tumor, both for uh, time to relapse and for overall survival. In terms of our multivariate analysis, the first analysis looked simply at the presence or absence of uh, contrast enhancement and its relationship to time to relapse. And on multivariate analysis, it did not retain its significance. Though, of course, some of the usual suspects, uh, astrocytic component and a higher WHO grade, were indeed correlated with, with uh, poorer uh, time to relapse. Um, similarly, for uh, overall survival, we did not find that uh, the presence of enhancement preoperatively was, was related in this study to overall outcome. Now, in terms of time to relapse and in looking at the enhancing patients only, the burden of preoperative enhancing volume did indeed seem to be related to a uh, poorer survival. And uh, interestingly, the, the, the amount of postoperative enhancing tumor tissue, as well as the percentage of contrast resection, when analyzed continuously, did hold some significance in this analysis. But again, when one breaks down or stratifies the degree of resection into the three groups, as we discussed earlier, only in the group where there was 100% resection of all contrast enhancing uh, 
uh, tumor tissue, irrespective of grade or other clinical factors, was there in fact a survival benefit, both in terms of time to relapse and overall survival. And in terms of the genetic factors that we analyzed, there was no relationship between enhancing status or the volume of enhancing tumor tissue and any genetic cofactor, particularly 1P19Q status of these tumors. And so, to our knowledge, this is the first study to, to clearly show an independent prognostic benefit of increased surgical resection in oligodendrogliomas, but albeit in the enhancing subset. And certainly, that does raise questions about what is enhancing tissue and how does that relate to the tumor metabolically and oncogenetically. But nevertheless, there are potential implications for practice here. Uh, the data would suggest that more aggressive surgery ought to be attempted for these tumors, for enhancing oligodendroglial tumors. And that raises the importance of intraoperative histopathological diagnosis of oligodendroglial tumors. And to that end, intraoperative adjuncts, as we've heard at this conference, 5ALA and uh, intraoperative uh, uh, handheld confocal microscopy may be useful in helping to resect these tumors more aggressively. Of course, the study is limited by the fact that it is retrospective, and uh, compared to the literature, we had a high proportion of enhancing tumors. We also had a high proportion of patients that uh, were excluded because of incomplete imaging, and so one wonders if the entire uh, data set had been analyzed, how that would have impacted the results. Strictly speaking, our volumetric method has not yet been validated, though we would argue that we used a very robust methodology in obtaining those tumor uh, volumes. And so in conclusion, among oligodendroglial tumors uh, that enhance, increased surgical resection is an independent predictor of time to relapse and overall survival. Complete resection of enhancing uh, tumor confers a very significant benefit to survival, and that enhancement does not seem to be a product of or related to the genetic makeup of these tumors such as we understand them at present. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Barrow Neurological Institute, which uh, supported me as a research fellow there, and my home institution of the University of Alberta Division of Neurosurgery for allowing me to go down there and do some of this work. Thank you. Our discussant is Dr. Tim Riken from the great state of Iowa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, I'd like to thank the NAANS for the opportunity to uh, comment and uh, Dr. Sankra for his uh, replies to my emails asking him the questions as we got ready. I have a couple of disclosures uh, as uh, noted here. I don't think any of these will impact what I have to say this morning. I got the opportunity, I believe, to speak uh, here briefly um, because of this paper we published some years ago. and. Uh, um, it, it brought out, uh, it basically came out of our conferences, and we were sitting around looking at these tumors and trying to figure out what, what the role of enhancement was for the oligodendroglioma preoperatively. And we asked this question, does contrast enhancement uh, help us differentiate the anaplastic from simply progressive oligo? And I'd ask you, in the context of surgical resection consideration, to keep in mind the location of these lesions in these next three slides, because one of the one of the problems with retrospective data collection is you have the inability to collect uh, information on quality of life. You can't do any kind of. Uh, it's very difficult to do retrospective uh, uh, quality and functional outcomes. And and with only 15 or 16 percent of the patients being candidates for a total resection, uh, we have to wonder what that impact would be if we had uh, become more aggressive on the quality of life. So if you look at the tumor like this. This ended up being anaplastic oligo, uh, but just a very minimal amount of, uh, of enhancement, as you see on the, on the far right. Here's one that turned out to stay as a low-grade oligodendroglioma, uh, and yet it also shows some enhancement uh, in, that, in the slide far on the right. And another example here of, a, of, a, of a, uh, um, an anaplastic without any enhancement, uh, as, it, as it turns out. So when we, we looked at this series, and the, um, we basically... Uh, concluded that the answer was no. Contrast enhancement really is not predictive of the presence of anaplasia in follow-up with a sensitivity of about 60-some uh, percent and specificity of 50 percent. So basically it was as good as flipping a coin uh, when, you, when you wanted to use that uh, as an assessment. So that being said, any paper that attempts or any study that attempts to look at the continuing role and the evolving role of surgery for glioma surgery is very welcome. Having worked on this committee uh, uh, to put the guidelines out for the glioblastoma literature and the malignant glioma literature, we were 
uh, relatively shocked, I guess, to find the paucity of data that we really had to work with on such a central issue to, uh, to tumor surgeons. And I, I don't disagree at all with his, uh, Dr. Sanker's comment that that's probably the first uh, paper really looking aggressively at the role of resection for oligodendroglial tumors. So uh, very much welcome uh, information there. Uh, a nice article and very scholarly review by uh, Dr. Berger and Sanai was just uh, put out last year. Their conclusions also being uh, both for the malignant gliomas and the, and the more benign tumors that there is significant limitations in the quality of data examining the extent of resection. Overall, I think we have the sense that it's a good thing to do when it can be done. So uh, I think uh, I applaud the authors, and I think we need to uh, continue looking carefully at this kind of issue. Uh, this is, again, a retrospective study. Any conclusion from that would require uh, prospective validation, but uh, it certainly is an important study and one that adds significantly to our literature. Thank you very much.